Vous êtes sur le point d'écouter Distorsion, un podcast sur... Um, I've looked for Maura Murray in Quebec City, and now I've looked for her in Tallahassee. But here I am, once again, on my own, in the middle of nowhere, hunting after leads that go nowhere. Des histoires étranges de l'ère numérique. Bonsoir, Émile Gauthier. Comment vas-tu? Ça va très bien, Seb, parce que ce soir, on a un invité de marque, oui. l'auteur et blogueur James Renner, bien connu pour son travail dans la recherche euh, sur Maura Murray. Euh, James, pendant des années, a documenté un blog. Euh, il a fait énormément d'investigations par lui-même et il a finalement écrit l'excellent livre « True Crime Addict » qui décrit son expérience personnelle dans la recherche de Maura Murray et comment lui, personnellement, a été absorbé par, euh, par cette histoire-là. Ah, ça va être vraiment intéressant. C'est vraiment un honneur pour nous, en fait, de, oui. de, de le recevoir. Et on a pris des questions des auditeurs, oui, justement, pour, pour nourrir un peu la discussion. Donc, si vous avez fait l'effort, ou du moins si vous nous avez demandé, posé des questions pour James, on va lui transmettre ce soir. Absolument. Ça sera une entrevue en anglais. Vous le oui. savez, nous, on n'est pas barré dans les langues à <rire> distorsion, mais ça sera bien agréable de, de parler à James. Aussi, c'est vrai, James a annoncé qu'il fermait son blog. Oui. Donc, après après plusieurs années, euh, j'ai bien hâte aussi de discuter de ça avec lui. Mm -hmm. euh, James était aussi venu au Québec à une certaine époque pour faire de la recherche sur Maura Murray. Donc, c'est évidemment une piste que je veux explorer avec lui, la piste du Québec dans toute cette histoire-là. Mm -hmm. Ça risque d'être fort intéressant. On a un shout-out ce soir de Marie Bull qui nous a fait une review 5 étoiles sur Apple Podcasts et elle nous dit « Oukt » qui veut dire euh, « accroché ».« Accroché », exact. « Hey, grâce à votre spécial avec Ars Moriandi, j'ai découvert votre podcast. Continuez votre bel job, les gars. » Et aussi, évidemment, avant de se lancer dans cet oui. euh, épisode passionnant, on a une tournée de bière qui nous vient cette fois de Marika, qui nous offre une excellente bière, la Gélinote de la microbrasserie La Chasse Peinte de lens saint jean un beau petit village dans le fjord du Saguenay. Euh, si vous êtes familier avec la, la topographie <rire> du Québec, c'est un endroit vraiment génial. C'est une Golden Ale, une blonde au sapin euh, à 5,1% d'alcool. Vous allez dire que c'est rare qu'on boit de la blonde, oui. mais quand on en boit, on boit pas n'importe la quelle à distorsion. Euh, cette bière-là, elle a des goûts là, de jeunes pousses de sapin baumier. C'est quand même assez particulier. C'est la seule bière ouais. que j'ai euh, dégustée jusqu'à présent qui a ce, ce goût-là. -là, c'est pas trop non plus... Euh, euh, quand on pense sapin, parfois on pense à épinette et tout ouais. ça, là, mais on n'est pas là-dedans. Là. On est quand même dans une blonde très rafraîchissante, une mousse bien dense. Là, on la boit en bouteille, évidemment. Et euh, c'est une bière euh, fort agréable. Vraiment, ce n'est pas une bière d'épinette. Si vous voulez faire comme Marika et encourager distorsion, encourager le show, vous pouvez nous offrir vous aussi une tournée de bière au distorsionpodcast.com dans l'onglet tournée de bière et vous pouvez faire un don et nous suggérer une bière de votre région. Donc Seb, est-ce qu'on est prêt à rejoindre James Renner en ligne sur Skype? Oui monsieur! C'est parti! So hi everybody, we're on the line with author and blogger James Renner. It's been it's been a long time. It's been a, a long awaited interview. How are you, Mr. Renner? Uh bonsoir. I am I am just fine. Merci I'm, I'm beaucoup. Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot for uh, you know taking the time to uh, do this interview, James. I know you're probably uh, pretty busy. Uh, there's a ton of stuff that I'd like to talk with you tonight. Uh, we heard as well that you are closing your blog, so this is this is some big news. But we'll come we'll come to that a little bit later. I'd like maybe first to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, James. Uh, how did you start writing about true crime? And I know you also worked on fictional stories. How How did you uh, how did you start writing about uh, about crimes? I think I can trace it all back to um, the abduction of Amy Mihalovic, mm -hmm. uh, which happened in 1989, and uh, I was 11 years old at the time. And uh, Amy was Amy and I were both born in 1978. So when I was 11, this girl from the town next door was abducted. 
and she was abducted from in front of uh, from this shopping plaza, this little outdoor plaza, in broad daylight on a Friday afternoon, and directly across from the police station. Hmm. And in my eleven-year-old mind, it was really the first time I realized that we live in a dangerous world. And if this could happen to Amy Mihalovic in Bay Village, Ohio, it could happen to any one of us. So it really changed the way I looked at the world. And I, you know, I'd see her posters up on the telephone poles all around town. And my first thought when I saw the picture is, hey, you know, this is a girl that if she was in my class, in Miss Klein's sixth grade class, I'd be passing notes to her. And yet she's gone. So I used to get on my Huffy, my Huffy two-speed bike, and I'd ride to Westgate Mall, which was this gigantic indoor mall um, outside of Cleveland, because I figured that that was where the most people were at any given time. And if somebody had taken Amy, maybe she'd end up back there. So I'd look for her in crowds, and then her body was discovered in um, about three months later, and. I would still ride to the mall and look for her killer in the crowds uh, based on the composite sketch that some witnesses had had helped do. So um, I was obsessed with solving these unsolved crimes uh, at a very young age. And I always thought about Amy's case and, and wondered what there was to do to solve it and what what an, an average person could do to help. And uh, I became a journalist. And... Amy's case was the first big story that I pitched, and I figured by then, you know, I'm, I'm in my 20s. It's been 16 years since the abduction. Surely the police had to know who did it. Uh, they just didn't have enough evidence. But when I started looking into it, it quickly became apparent that the reason they'd never solved the crime is there were too many, <clears throat> there were too many men with the means, motive, and opportunity to, to commit the crime. And that was another big, uh, you know, awakening moment for me. And I realized that, uh, you know, I was kind of in over my head. So this article became, um, you know, much too big for, for a newspaper. Uh, and I turned it into a book. And mm -hmm. then that book was published in 2006, Amy, My Search for Her Killer. And everything else kind of came out of there. I, I quickly became... You know, I would I would go to libraries and I would talk about Amy's case. And then afterwards, people would come up to me and, and they'd say, hey, have you ever looked into the murder of Beverly Jaros or Lisa Pruitt or, or um, the disappearance of uh, Ted Conrad? And so I was kind of handed all these other cases and I started writing about them. And then one book led to another and I started, you know, got to a point where I was able to um, – um, do that for a living. And uh, I, I've been trying to venture more into to fiction because I really love writing about mysteries that I can actually solve. Uh, you know, but, you know, every five years or so, I get really taken by a new case and, and have to research it and write about it. And Maura Murray was that last case, and, and that became the basis of uh, True Crime Addict, my, my latest book. Yeah, I know some cases like that can get you hooked so bad that it's hard to think about anything else. How how did you first get hooked by the Maura Murray case uh, at the very first place? Sure. Well, I was I at the time this was back in 2010, I think. I was actively looking for a new case to write about and I wanted to get outside of my comfort zone, get outside of Northeast Ohio and I wanted to find a really big case, a national case that really hadn't been looked at too much uh, that, that, that could, you know, have, have, could be helped with some research. So I remember being at home and watching this 2020 special that was a combination of um, they, they looked into Brooke Wilberger's case and also Maura Murray. And right off the bat, Brooke Wilberger struck me as a, um, a typical abduction uh, and murder. But when I heard about, more Murray's case, the more I heard about it, the more I became curious because, you know, you've got the, the central mystery of this nursing student who took off, um, who lied to her professors and said, there's been a death in the family, you know, hold my work till the end of the week. 
which was a lie. And then she drives into the mountains of New Hampshire, gets into a car crash at 730. And then between the time of the accident and the time the police show up, we're talking a window there of about three to seven minutes. Oh, yeah. That window, she vanishes. And I realized this isn't just one mystery. It's actually two that are kind of wrapped around each other. You know, what happened to Maura Murray, right? But also, what was she doing in the White Mountains to begin with? And I figured if I could, I figured my odds were good. I figured if I could answer one of those questions, it would get us closer to the other. And I spent the next five years researching it. And and I do believe that I solved part of it, which is that it's very obvious to me that she was running away from her life um, and never coming back to UMass. And, uh, you know, she was getting away from the men in her life. She was traveling with a tandem driver. I'm sure. I'm sure she was traveling with um, another car. Yeah, I think we we share the same.、Yeah. Uh, we share pretty much the same opinion here about、uh, the tandem driver, James.、Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll get we'll get to that a little bit later because a lot of our I know a lot of our listeners are interested by this、uh, this scenario as well.、Uh, I would say if we if we look at the big picture,、uh, why do you think this case attracted and still attracts a lot of attention from the internet communities? Well, I think it's because Moore Murray's case is a、um, It's kind of like that Rorschach test, you know, the the test that you know some psychologists use,、uh, where they show you kind of this ink blot, and they they ask you, what does this mean to you? And based on your answer, they're able to kind of determine your personality and and your subconscious. And more Murray's cases like that because there's enough clues that'll take you any way you want to go.、Um, You know, you can decide that Maura Murray committed suicide. You can decide that she was abducted by a random stranger. You can decide that the cops were involved, that she was running away, that she was murdered by somebody she knew. You can get to any explanation, or she simply wandered into the woods and died.、Um, so you can go down any avenue you want, and that makes it very personal to the person who. Looks into it because they're all you're bringing into it what you carry, you know, your own personality, your own biases,、um, your own thoughts. So、um, I think that's why it's so lasting and so interesting to people because、um, they decide that they're right, and it's personal to them because they.、Um, They see part of themselves in the case. Yeah, that's right. You said sooner that the the case with Amy changed your vision of life. Would you say、yeah. um, the case of Mora had an influence、uh, an influence on your life? If so,、uh, how did it change your life? Yeah. So Amy and Mora are kind of two ends of a spectrum, I guess.、Um, Amy changed my life. You know, looking into that case and knowing her family, and knowing the particulars of the people involved. Um, I'd say it changed my life for the better. You know, it made me more aware.、Um, it made me、uh, want to be a better person. Moore's case, on the other hand,、um, it's just there's so much negativity around it,、um, and there's no, there will be no happy ending to Moore's case.、Um, you know, she set out on her own,、um, and and the question. Comes back around to is there even a crime here? If she ran away, right,、mm-hmm. that's not a crime. So you know, did I waste all this time looking into a, a cold case that wasn't even, <laughs> you know, wasn't even a crime? And then there's nobody, there's nobody thanking me for the hours that I put into it.、Um, her family hates me with the white hot intensity of a thousand suns.、Um, so you know, they're very. You know, did I did I take anything away from Mora?、Um, I probably, but nothing good.
We thank you, James. Well, on our side, uh, <laughs> the whole distortion community, uh, thank you. But thank spe you. <laughs> but speaking of that, uh, I know you knocked on multiple doors, you know, reading your book, and while you were you were trying to chase some information, and you contacted so many people regarding this case. And uh, as I read your book, it seems that a lot of people that are very close to Mara were not very keen with sharing information. So why why do you think there's so many secrets? Among among Mara's friends and, and family. So in 2011, when I really started researching this case, Maura Murray had been held up on this pedestal, and she was made out to be the all-American girl, perfect to a fault. And yet, you didn't. Her her father was very combative with police mm -hmm. and very reserved with journalists. He would only agree to do interviews if he could control the questions that were asked and the answers that were given. So that was a red flag to me. Hmm. Um, so uh, remind me, <laughs> remind me of the question again. Uh, I got off. Is, I, yeah. The, the, the end of the, uh, yeah, I was, I was saying that, uh, you know, you, you, <laughs> no, you knocked on multiple doors, you try to chase some information, but a lot of people were not very keen to share some information. Oh, yeah. So, so why do you think is there so many secrets among Mora's friends and entourage and family? Yeah. So, you know, she was, she was made out to be perfect and I, you hmm. know, none of us are, you know, we're all contradictions. And uh, so I think the reason why there are so many secrets in this and, and why the, the, the family were so standoffish is because they knew the reality. They knew that Moore was troubled and they were in a difficult position. Um, on one hand, they really wanted to find Mora. They wanted to know what happened to her. On the other hand, they couldn't be open and honest with the media um, or with police. I don't know how honest they were with police either. Uh, I know for a fact Fred uh, changed his story about the night um, of the accident in um, uh, Haverhill, or not Haverhill, but Hadley, Massachusetts, which occurred um, a couple days before she disappeared in, in New Hampshire. So, um, and the reason behind that is, you know, when I started researching this, one of the first things I found was that Maura was in a lot of trouble when she disappeared. Hmm. She was, um, she had been charged with credit card fraud. She had committed yeah. identity theft, uh, and she was the whole reason she was at UMass is because she was about to be kicked out of West Point, but they let her drop out and transfer to UMass. And she was about to be kicked out because she had stolen from Fort Knox. She had stolen from the most secure facility mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, and we're not talking, she didn't steal gold, but she stole, she stole makeup, like $4 worth of makeup from the commissary. This, these, her actions are the actions of a person um, screaming for help uh, and the actions of a person that is not acting logically. So um, those were the secrets, some of many, that the family was worried about getting out. So that's why, that's why they acted differently than, than most families of missing people. One theory that you brought on the table that could bring some answer to the mystery is the tandem driver, like we talked uh, sooner. Can you tell us a little bit more about this theory? Sure. Um, so you got to take a look at the scene of the accident in Haverhill, New Hampshire, uh, when she disappeared. She uh, comes around this 90 degree turn on Route 112. Uh, about 7.30 at night, it's dark that time of year. She crashes into a snowbank. Yeah. And uh, Butch Atwood comes up in his bus and asks her if she needs help. And she quickly, you know, gets him away from the scene by saying, oh, I called AAA. Don't worry about it. He knew that was a lie because you can't get cell phone service up there. Um, so he heads to his house. There are two other homes. You've got Butch Atwood watching the scene. Then you have the, the, uh, the Westman's watching from their house, this older couple that was practically right across the street. And then you've got John Merritt um, and his son in a house nearby. So you've got, I, I picture it as like the scene of the accident is dark, right? And then each of these people that are casually watching the scene of the accident, they're like, I picture them like um, 
like lighthouses. And when they're watching, the scene's illuminated because some of them are seeing Mora in the front seat and then she gets out and she's doing something around the trunk. So most of the time, at least one of those people are watching the scene. So you've got this window of about at most seven minutes. And most of the time she's being watched. All we know for sure, she disappears. Um, and the scent dogs that they used uh, a day or two later trace her scent to the middle of the road. So by all appearances, she gets into a car. Um, and then there's a search afterwards down that road, and she's never seen again. So you have to almost assume that she got into a car. Now, what are the chances that a serial killer just happens to be passing by mm -hmm. in that window and manages to get her into the car without anybody seeing? It's, it's ridiculous to think that. So what's the answer? Well, there is an answer because if somebody she knew pulled up, she could have gotten into the car and taken off in a, in a span of about 10 seconds. Whereas if it was somebody she didn't know, there had to have been communication. There had to have been, oh, what happened? Oh, I got into an accident. Hey, can I give you a ride? Sure, let me get my things. That's going to take at least a minute. In that time, somebody's going to see that pickup. And none of the neighbors saw her get into a car. So we have to assume, A, that she did get into a car because of the, the evidence, and two, that it happened so quickly nobody saw it. And the only way for that to happen is if she knew that person. So, yes, I believe there was a tandem driver. I believe the tandem driver was ahead of her. She got into the accident. The tandem driver sees she's no longer following and eventually turns around, comes and picks her up, and, and they take off. So I think it's possible she actually continued on to her destination that night, which may have been this uh, cabin that was owned by the outing club of the University of, um, of Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, uh, where she went to school, University of Massachusetts Amherst. They had this outing club, and they had a cabin just down the road a ways. Um, and in order to get there, you would have gone the exact route that Moore would have taken that night. Yeah, I kind of share your, uh, and I think Seb uh, yeah. probably shares it too, this, this opinion about the, the tandem driver scenario. It's... It, It's tough because we don't have we don't have any facts we don't have any clear evidence, but as you said, James, based on the very very short timeline that we have, based on the fact that you know there's no footsteps in the snow leading to the woods or there's no other cars being seen, uh, I think it will it will make sense too. I think so, you know, and I, whenever somebody talks to me, you know, whenever somebody mentions this and they say, well, there's no evidence. The first thing I think of is um, the planet Neptune and how before we found it, there was no evidence that it existed. But we noticed that, uh, uh, that Saturn and Uranus, they, they wobbled a little bit in a way that we couldn't explain. Um, and the only way to explain it is this fantastic idea that there was a new planet out there that nobody had seen. And That's kind of how I view this. There's no direct evidence that Mora got into a car that was driven by a friend of hers. But how else do you explain all the evidence? I, I can't come up with a single other explanation that, that satisfies everything. And we, we've watched, uh, you know, the documentary series on the Oxygen uh, Network. Uh, we uh, listened to some of, uh, you know, the, the Tim and Lance podcast about missing Maura Murray. Uh, and there's, um, I mean, a lot of people seem to put a lot of weight into this A-frame house theory. That yeah, that's strange to me. Yeah, uh, it could, what, what, is your, what is your opinion on, on that theory? And maybe you could explain a little bit more what, what it is. Yeah, so this A-frame house is this creepy abandoned house that is near the accident scene, or was abandoned, um, or uh, it was abandoned when we went there to investigate it, but at the time it was owned by this um, kind of seedy local guy who was into younger women um, and had a history of domestic violence. And uh, I've never understood the fascination with the A-frame house because it doesn't 
explain anything else that happened that night. And it just assumes that this bad man happened upon Mora or Mora accidentally wandered into the property um, without anybody else knowing about it and then was murdered in a closet upstairs. Um, it's just a far-fetched theory that uh, doesn't have any basis in, in, in fact, it doesn't, there's no evidence to support it, but um, you know, the, the documentary, you know, they led up to these, this big reveal of these wood chips and the, it was just kind of silly. Um, and I didn't understand that part at all. Since we are based in Montreal and both of us are from Quebec city, how did you oh. find about this Quebec theory? Yeah, we, we, we come from uh, Quebec city. Yeah. <laughs> okay. First of all, Like when I visited Quebec City, I, I'm not joking. It was it was negative 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is actually also negative 40 degrees Celsius. It's it's where the the two cross over. I you know I live in Northeast Ohio and it's cold here uh, in the winters, <laughs> but like it's not that cold. And there's a million people living in Quebec City. It's beautiful up there. It's absolutely beautiful. But how do you survive the winter months up there? How do you do it? Yeah, that's that, that, that's that's tough, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but it's tough. The people are they are they are very tough. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you know, the, the, what led us up there was um, there was a post on this message board years ago, and it was very definitive, and it said that it was posted by a friend of Mora's from school, who happened to be. Uh, up in, I think it was Montreal at the time, walking down a street and passed Mora on the street and kind of forgotten about the fact that she was missing. And, you know, just saw Mora and said, hey, Mora. And, and Mora turned and looked at her. And the, the poster said she was with a very handsome young man and seemed happy. But she got really scared when she was called out and hurried away. Uh, and there was always just kind of this ring of truth to that to that post. So uh, there was that one connection to the area. And then there was a similar posting that claimed that Mora was in, um, if I'm saying it right, St. Uh, Beauharnois um, area. Yeah. And uh, so there were there were a couple clues that led to um, that general region. And. We thought, you know, me and Tim and Lance from the podcast, we thought we'd go up there and hang up some flyers and, and stop at some public places to see if anybody had seen Mora. Because nobody had done that before, which is, which is odd, too, because no doubt about it, whether or not these sightings turn out to be credible, they were posted as fact. And the family had not followed up on it. Um, the police had not followed up on it. We were the first ones to really go up there and, and try to find her. And we showed her picture around and, and there were a couple people who were adamant that were a hundred percent there. They said, yes, I've seen this woman. One of them was at a fitness facility and more as the type that she, you know, if she's alive today, she's, she's working out, you know, she's running still. You, you can't turn that off. Um, But then another great sighting was up in Quebec City at this record store, um, Le Knock, uh, Knockout. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we spoke to this woman named Roxanne who, who worked there, and she was sure that the person she saw was Mora. In fact, she's, she's sure to this day. If you watch the documentary, they kind of write that off because they do this um, – updated sketch of what more might look like today. And I don't know if you saw the sketch, but it's yeah. like, it's like this. No, this is the worst. <laughs> this is the worst composite sketch you, you could have done. This looks nothing like more would look like today. And so of course, when they showed it to the record store owner, she's like, no, that doesn't look like her. Um, and they're like, well, it wasn't Mora. Um, but then she contacts uh, people afterwards, and the record store owner's like, yeah, no, I said it didn't look like her because that looked nothing like the woman. Um, you know, I know what Maura Murray likes. I know what she'd look like a few years older, and I'm still sure that I saw Maura Murray. 
Yeah, because we we also spoke to Roxanne when we did our our episode about Maura Murray. Uh, oh, wow. uh, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, we, uh, I mean, I'm from this neighborhood actually, where where you guys uh, went uh, record shopping. How could I say? So, <laughs> uh, so yeah. So I knew her from the the Quebec City's music scene, and I knew that 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 record store. Uh, and same thing, Roxanne told us that she's hundred percent sure. And uh, of course, it's it's just. It's just a testimonial among uh, many other sightings. But at the same time, uh, I, I don't want to rule that theory out because, uh, in a way, I think it makes a lot of sense. I do, too. I do, too. And I, I, I hope that's what happened. I, I hope that she went on and, and found a way to live a new life up in Canada. That would be amazing. And why do you think about, uh, you know, why are you so... Uh, negative i would say about her her destiny well all this information about her boyfriend has come out since um you know over the last couple of years and it's hard to ignore um at the time of her disappearance she was with this guy bill roush and uh he was at fort sill um he was in the military he was at fort sill when she disappeared and then he flies into new hampshire The last couple of years, all this in, uh, the, these women have come forward, and uh, I put their stories on my blog. In fact, I, I audio uh, recorded uh, some conversations with them, and Bill stands accused in Washington, D.C. of um, attempted rape, um, of sexual assault, of uh, a, a simple assault. One woman he worked at wor worked with in D.C. claims that he assaulted her sexually in the office of the president of Ray Group International, which is where they both worked at the time. This would have been 2011, uh, around the time I started looking into the case. Uh, and it happened on St. Patrick's Day, uh, late that night. And, um, you know, she, luckily the assault was interrupted by another coworker coming into the office. And Bill, according to her, hid under the desk and told her, you know, don't effing tell anybody about this. And uh, really scared her. Um, and then another woman came forward who had a relationship with Bill six months after Moore disappeared. And she claims that he grabbed her by the neck and squeezed and said, I'm going to kill you just like I killed Moore Murray. Um, he's also accused of pushing a woman down the steps on the Metro in DC. Uh, and um, this, this woman was on her way to work and she's shoved and pushed down the stairs um, and it rips her, her hose. It, she gets hurt and she looks up in enough time to see Bill kind of dashing uh, away at the top of the escalator. And she even confronts him about it and uh, he kind of laughs it off. And then later when he allegedly assaults her in the president's office, he says, I know you saw me that day and seems to get, you know, a kick out of that. So he's a creep. Um, and so is it just a coincidence that his, that his girlfriend's disappeared or, you know, is there something more to that? Um, I, I definitely think he should be looked at. Is it what you, uh, what you would say is your final theory about, uh, the Morris case? Is it where, you know, all of these research led you to? I, I'd say that all that I'm comfortable claiming to have discovered is that, she was not traveling alone that night when she disappeared, that she was traveling with at least one other person. What happens after that? I don't know. I, I hope, I hope she, she made it and started another life, but it's possible somebody caught up with her later in the week and, and killed her. That would be uh, very tragic. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, there's, you know, one of the, the reason, you know, you mentioned early on that I'm shutting down the blog And I am, um, you know, probably it looks like it's going to happen May 1st, you know, the 1st of May. And the reason I'm doing that is because, you know, this conclusion that I came to is it's either one or the other, you know, scenario here. Either either one, uh, she, she went on to live a new life, in which case, you know, why would I keep the information up there to, to help find this woman that doesn't want to be found? Or two, she was murdered by somebody that she knew. Um, and the police have all that information. The, the only reason my, my website would, would be helpful at this point is if, uh, is, is if she was abducted by a 
random killer, you know, and, and that information that's on my website might lead to find them, but there's no part of me that believes that that's a possibility anymore. So I'm not helping anything by keeping that information up there. And in fact, I might be hurting. We'll jump to some uh, questions asked by our uh, community. Uh, James, uh, if you still have a little bit of time. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have a couple questions from a fellow podcaster from France, actually. Uh, Lionel Camille, uh, he's a French podcaster and author of books about uh, disappearances as well. And he did uh, uh, an episode and he investigated a lot the Maura Murray's case. So uh, we want to offer him the chance to uh, ask you some questions. Um, the first Great. one, yeah, first questions from uh, Lionel is, did Maura really stop in the town of Haverhill just before the crash? And he mentions that the cop, John Monaghan's, uh, checked at the C uh, CCTV tapes and said he found nothing. Yeah. Um, and that's another, you know, th there were a couple issues I had with the documentary. And, th and this is definitely one of them because they, they bring in John Monaghan and uh, they say this thing about, um, let me back up a little bit. So there was this, this um cashier at this grocery store called uh, Butson's and she claims that she saw Mora there with two other women about an hour before the accident, about an hour before she crashed into a snowbank. So before she, said, she reached uh, Haverhill. Yeah. So um, she said Mora came in with two friends and uh, they bought some, I think, booze and cigarettes and then left. So then the documentary Uh, interviews this John Monahan and, and, and they say, oh, John went to Butson's and looked at the camera footage and Maura wasn't on there, so we can rule that out. Well, no, you can't, because if you had done the research and, and actually went and talked to the people at that grocery store and Butson's, you'd discover that the cameras in there were only there because there was a, uh, a bank, a bank branch in the grocery store, and the cameras were only pointed at the bank. They weren't pointed at the doors. They weren't pointed at the cashier. So Maura could have come in there just like the cashier said, got her stuff and left um, and managed to do it in a way that, that wasn't on camera. Um, so that when I heard that, that, that kind of drove me crazy. Yeah, and another question here from Lionel that also drives me crazy is uh, he's asking, uh, what do you think about the rag in the tailpipe uh, put in the, the Saturn? Could it be Mora or someone else, or when and why? And personally, I'm so confused with that rag in the ta tailpipe story. What, what do you think about that? I don't know what to make of that. Um, it would be a huge clue in the case, if not for Mora's father. Um, because you've got this missing woman, and then you find the car, and you find this rag stuck up in the tailpipe. And you think, oh my God, somebody shoved that rag up in the tailpipe to get her car to stall. But then Fred Murray, her father, comes out and says, oh, no, 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 no. Don't worry about the rag in the tailpipe. That rag came from her trunk. I had given it to her. And I told her that if her car was smoking, to go ahead and stick the rag up, up in the tailpipe so that she wasn't pulled over by, by police. Um, That doesn't pass the smell test for many reasons. Um, one, it's a really stupid thing to do. And I would think Fred Murray's a little smarter than to tell his daughter to do that. Because you run the risk of stalling the car and, 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 and getting into a crash of, or, or something. Um, so why, why is Fred telling people this? Um, you know, some people think that, you know, was it some sort of signal to her father? Um, Did she, did he really tell her that, um, you know, it couldn't, there's only two people that could have put that rag in the tailpipe based on what Fred Murray says. <clears throat> One of them is Maura Murray. The other is Fred Murray. Uh, you know, and, you know, did Fred say this because he knows his fingerprints are on that, that rag? I guess, you know, we have to take Fred at his word, um, that, He told her to do this stupid thing, and and she did it. Um, whether or not it led to her car stalling, and that's why she crashed, you know, I don't know. They did it. They did some tests, and apparently that's not really going to stall the car. But um, it probably doesn't have anything to do with her disappearance. 
Lino has uh, an interesting theory, and he wants uh, he wants to to send it over to you and and see what what you think about that. So, if Mora stopped to buy something in Haverhill, maybe a criminal put a rag into the tailpipe of her car. That's why the uh, the the engine of the Saturn stalled. The accident was a sabotage, and the criminal could have kidnapped Mora on the road, so she could be still locked somewhere today. The only problem with that, right? is that the rag came from Mora's trunk. So how did the killer get access to her trunk and then put the rag in the tailpipe? So I think it almost kind of rules that situation out. And then you're also left with how was this person able to accomplish taking her and abducting her inside of three houses? Uh, I, I think that can kind of be ruled out. Seb, I think you have uh, another question from... Uh yeah, one of our listeners. Yeah, we have a question from a, a YouTuber, uh, Victoria Charlton. Once you mentioned you talk Mora wa was a sociopath, what was the community reaction about that? How did the family and friends uh, react? Well, it wasn't good. <laughs> uh, um, at the time, here's what I here's what I had. I had this woman who disappeared, and I knew that she was in in trouble for credit card fraud identity theft. She'd stolen for, from Fort Knox. She was having uh, an affair with her track coach. Um, she was at the same time um, having these uh, group um, get togethers with uh, three men from the track team uh, late at night in the, in the pool house. It would be her and her friend and these three men. And during the course of the night, she had sex with each of these men. And I've talked to the men involved. Um, you had all that going on. Uh, she's lying to her professors. Um, all this, all these lies, all the, all the crimin criminal activity, all this, of course, you know, it leads one to believe that this person might, might be a, a sociopath. Um, but the one piece that I didn't have at the time that I said that was the information about her boyfriend, Bill Roush and uh, the things that he's done, at least since Morris disappeared. And there were people he went to, uh, uh, there were people that he went to high school with that have told me he was abusive way back then. So before and after, he's probably the same with, with Mora. Um, now, in light of that, you go back to and look at Mora's behavior. And, um, you know, I, I believe that her actions are more of a survivor that that when she left, she was in a survival mode that mm -hmm. she was, you know, that the, these actions were cries for help and not necessarily um, sociopathic behavior. Let's jump to another question from uh, Helen. She's asking, and let me know if uh, you're not comfortable, James, but <laughs> did you sometime feel that you were too close to the truth in your investigation? And is there anything that you just couldn't write for different reasons? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that, that, um, that I didn't include. Well, not a lot. I'd say there's, there's a handful of, of things that I was uh, given and told that I couldn't include for legal reasons, for ethical reasons, for, you know, things like that. And most of those have to do with Fred Murray and, and the type of guy he is and the type of things that he's alleged to have done. You know, these things that, uh, that I've held back, uh, you know, were held back because um, I don't believe that by announcing them or talking about them, it would help the case any. It wouldn't get us closer to, to finding out what happened to Mora. It might get us closer to finding out why she left, but it wouldn't ultimately find her. So, um, you know, the, the family gets mad at me that, you know, some of the, the community gets mad at me for the, some of the things that I that I did put out there. But there were things that, that were even more shocking than that that, uh, that I held back. And I did that to protect the family, believe it or not. We, uh, we jump uh, at another question from Thomas. Uh, looking back at everything you did for the case, do you have any regrets while doing this investigation? Um, I think I would have approached Mora's friends uh, a little differently um, if I had had it to do over again. Uh, you know, at the time I was very brusque, I was very direct, and uh, I might have used a lighter touch. 
<laughs> at the at the beginning. But you know, I just quickly became frustrated with you know the how unhelpful everybody was being, and um, you know most of that was because Fred Murray was was telling them not to talk to me, and I can't blame them for that. Uh, but yeah, you know, if, if anything, I, I, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd change how I approached sources in the beginning. Uh, a last question from GB disappearing and starting a new life in the modern, modern age is pretty difficult because of all the digital trace uh, we leave behind. If you wanted to disappear, uh, how would you do it? Oh yeah. That's, that's an interesting yeah. question, James. <laughs> well, I'll tell you if I was a woman, Um, a young woman that, you know, Moore's age and background, um, one way that I could start a new life is to go to a, um, a service like the House of Ruth or another battered woman's um, organization and tell them that I had been abused. Whether it's true, whether it's not, this is, this is one way to do it. Um, you would approach these organizations and um, a place like House of Ruth uh, according to people that have worked with them that have contacted me, uh, they can, uh, you know, organizations like them can set you up with a new identity, um, uh, a new means of um, finance until you get on your feet, um, a new location. And uh, they are as good, if not better, than the Federal Witness Protection Program. And there are a lot of people in uh, involved in, in helping them do what they do. And I have to say, I find it particularly interesting that one of the last calls that Moore made before she disappeared in the days leading up to her, her disappearance is she places a call to a social worker in Weymouth. Um, and Weymouth is where her father and her uncles and aunts lived. And the social worker, well, her job was to look into allegations of Uh, abuse of child abuse and she was an active investigator when Maura Murray was a child so that uh, is very interesting that's one way she could have done it um, in today's age is she could have gotten help from an organization that would protect abused and battered women but since you're not uh, a young woman uh, James <laughs> how, how would you disappear being a uh, A being a, a young man as as we as we are um yeah i would simply start traveling to south america you know you don't you can get across the border um without you know uh really needing a passport if you're going that way if you're going into mexico um and i would probably go to a place like uruguay uh where there's a lot of people that can speak english yeah Uh, and um, nobody's going to be looking for you there. Um, and, uh, you know, you could uh, eke out, you know, you, you take a, a few thousand dollars there and you could get set up pretty easily. So I just gave away my secret, you know. So uh, if, I, <laughs> if I do disappear, now I got to find some place other than Uruguay. Uh, Quebec City, maybe. Yeah, there you go. I should get a job at that the record store. With Roxanne. Yeah, that's that's right. She she already knows you. She remembered you, by the way, when uh, when we we talked uh, we talked about it together. Oh, great! Cool. Cool. So uh, thank you very much, James. That uh, those were all of our uh, questions from the community. Maybe maybe one last question uh, for you. What what can we expect next for James Renner? Uh, I know you you wrote different books. Uh, maybe I saw that you are about to start a podcast. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Thank you for asking about that. So uh, I I am starting a new podcast. It comes out in May. Hmm. Uh, it is called The Philosophy of Crime, and it kind of tackles the bigger questions in, in true crime, such as are killers made or are they born that way? Um, does everybody have the capacity to commit a murder? Uh, why is true crime so popular? And it looks to classical philosophy, you know, Plato, uh, Aristotle, um, and you know, tries to figure out what they would say about it or, and, and take some of their lessons and, and apply it to these crazy crimes that are going on today. So it's part philosophy, part crime, uh, part blog, uh, but it gets into some really interesting stories and bizarre twists and um, just just fun, 
fun uh, fun stories about about the genre. That's cool. We'll definitely definitely keep uh, keep an eye on it. And Thank you. Cool. Th- thank you very much, uh, James, uh, yeah, yeah. for your time. It was uh, it was a pleasure to to chat with you a little bit. Uh, I know you you uh, you've talked a lot about uh, Morris case in the past, so I hope that it was not uh, <laughs> was not too bad to talk about it again. <laughs> no, a- anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.